This week on the Back Table Podcast. We were able to kind of take it to the next level thanks to a bunch of different factors, including a grant that Susan um, helped us um, achieve, two smaller grants that Eric and, and I were able to get. And then just sort of the dream team of, you know, everybody's kind of brings a different thing to the table and are able to elevate something that um, sort of starts out uh, rather ordinary to what I would describe as an extraordinarily rich tool to use with patients. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Back Table podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and Backtable.com. Protect your most valuable asset, the skill and ability to practice your medical specialty. One out of three individuals become disabled during their career. Be prepared by establishing a specialty-specific disability insurance policy from the experts at DI4MDs. They represent all the major disability insurance companies that provide individual policies for physicians. Special discounts are available for all physicians, residents, and the military. Whether you have no coverage, or to compare and improve your current coverage, or take advantage of the new higher monthly benefit, contact them today at www.di4mds.com. Again, that's www.di4mds.com. Or call them at 888 934 Four six three seven. Again, that's eight 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 nine three four four six three seven. My name is Eric Keller. I'm a interventional radiology resident at Stanford, and I have the distinct honor today of introducing actually three guests, all part of a nonprofit organization called the Interventional Initiative that we'll talk more about in a second. So, hang with me a second. We're going to do introductions. All three of our guests are very impressive people. We have Susan Jackson, who conceived of and co-created the docu-series Without a Scalpel in 2014 and co-founded the Interventional Initiative in 2015. In addition to her board of directors role within the Interventional Initiative, Susan has contributed to the field of interventional radiology in numerous capacities since the 1990s. She is a formal interventional technologist, worked for a medical device company, and is currently the executive director of the Western Angiographic and Interventional Society, a position that she has held since 2003. While she is passionate about the innovative field of interventional radiology, Susan also has an MBA and is actively employed in a leadership role outside the healthcare industry, contributing to strategic planning and marketing initiatives. Other guests, second guest is Dr. Isabel Newton, interventional radiologist, physician scientist down at VA San Diego Medical Center and UCSC. Uh, she is also the Chief of IR and Wellness Director at the VA, co-founder and chair of the Interventional Initiative, and a very close and inspiring mentor of mine. And then finally, we have Margaret Seymour, who is a formal interventional radiology nurse, over 35 years of experience in the field. She's worked in IR over at UCSF, and prior to retiring, she was also the Director of the Cardiovascular Service Line, Clinical Operations, and Clinical Projects for John Muir Health in the East Bay of San Francisco. And since then, she's been on the board of the Interventional Initiative basically since its inception. These are kind of three of the main founding people, which is why they're, they're perfect to lead this episode. So I really appreciate you all coming on. Thank you. Yeah, of course. So maybe we should, should start kind of the, the goal for this episode is talking about the Interventional Initiative and then also their, their kind of new project, these patient decision aids, which I've had the honor to be a part of as well. So maybe we should just start with a little bit of history for those that might not be you know, familiar with the organization, the Interventional Initiative. So, so what is it? How did it get started? Susan, I think you're the best person to tell the story, having been the, the driver. How did it get started? Okay, well, the, the Interventional Initiative was founded in 2015, and really our goal was we were challenged to bridge the very significant health literacy knowledge gap uh, that the public has about minimally invasive image-guided procedures at, for various diseases. And uh, that challenge was made to us through a, a meeting back in 2014 at Western Angio. And so... Uh, we founded the organization. Uh, Isabel and I co-founded it and uh, 
set our mission to engage and educate the public about the life-saving value of minimally invasive image-guided procedures. So it's, it's really targeted at, at this raising awareness around these, these procedures that we do in the, you know, the field of interventional radiology, other specialties, of course, as well. And it's a nonprofit then, I understand. That's correct. We're a 501c3 organization. And um, we started with kind of our launch initiative. We, we set the organization up with these various initiatives. And our launch initiative was the docu-series Without a Scalpel. Without a Scalpel oh, yeah. is now distributed on 16 streaming platforms across 38 countries, most notably oh gosh. Amazon Prime Video. And what are some of those? So I know that... Um... When I was in medical school, actually, it was the first time that I, I heard about it. Um, I think it was debuting. They were doing like a viewing at an SIR conference and whatnot. Um, what, what are some of the, the episodes that people may have, may have seen? I, I kind of want to back up a little bit because, um, you know, Susan presents it like it just sort of appeared. But actually, it was through a whole lot of grit and um, a great deal of vision. And I credit Susan with that um, for saying, you know, why don't we use the medium of film to convey the wonder of a field that we know is inherently valuable to patients? And many patients who could benefit from these procedures don't even know that it exists. And so um, she approached this as she does with everything, which is how hard can it be? Let's just learn about it and do it. And so um, she looked into how you make a docu documentary and the two of us kind of embarked on this. So the first episode um, was really about blood vessels that are closed being open again. So um, we featured um, Brooke Spencer reopening an occluded IVC. We um, featured um, Greg Alzate opening occluded um, vessels in the in arteries in the leg. And from there, you know, we thought it was just going to start as as its standalone documentary, but it became a docu series because quickly we recognized the power of telling stories um, in this medium and then um, made additional episodes. The second one about liver cancer, the third one about pelvic congestion syndrome, and the fourth one about aneurysms in the body. And uh, one other thing is now it's available also on YouTube, um, making it even more accessible um, to many people. And we've been told um, by trainees, um, by patients, by even people in industry that this has offered a really welcoming a point of entry into the field of minimally invasive image guided procedures because it makes it more accessible. So for us, that's a win. Totally. I mean, it's it seems like just from the number of views that it, it must be having a great impact. Are, are there other things uh, like other initiatives that start out? I know that, you know, without the scalpel has been been kind of this giant win for the the organization. What what about other things? Are are really three initial initiatives were the media committee and the media initiative, which is without a scalpel, the docu-series. We did some other short videos to help kind of explain the history of IR as well as some particular procedures, but also another initiative, our online community center, which is what we refer to as our website, which has extensive content about many procedures. And so that's, uh, of course, public facing. And then our social media initiative, which was uh, the goal is to engage the public directly, encourage them to learn more um, by visiting the website. And so the three of those were sort of set up to work in sync with each other and kind of reinforce more information about minimally invasive image guided procedures. And was it really just just you three kind of at the inception or are there, there are other people? I understand it. it's grown since then. Yeah, so um, Margaret has been, you know, in her role as, um, you know, in leadership in hospitals, really came in and helped us uh, navigate filming in a hospital, which is complicated because you want to protect patient autonomy, patient privacy. Um, there are HIPAA considerations. And uh, so uh, that is, and I'll let Margaret kind of speak to that and also speak to the difficulties presented by the pandemic, perhaps. For me, this was a great segue from hospital life into my retirement to be able to keep my fingers still in the interventional radiology community and in, in all these uh, catheter-based procedures. So one of the things that I really enjoyed was being able to make those connections with the staff prior to arriving at our various hospitals that were so welcoming to us to come and film. It's very challenging when you bring a crew in to a hospital because we have to make sure that the hospital is um, is safe 
and the patients are safe and that we aren't creating obstacles from not just the privacy, but from a uh, licensing standard, if you will, an accreditation standard. So we make sure that all of our crew before they come in have all the requisite vaccinations and uh, whatever testing that a staff person would have and uh, work with the staff um, to educate them about uh, who we are and what our purpose for being there is. So they, they were, no, we want to make sure that we're going to not only highlight uh, the incredible care that they give to their patients, but we're going to show them in the best light possible. I think one of the other things that I really enjoyed uh, working on were our animation videos, little shorts, getting to inter mm. interact with um, a couple of patients uh, and their families to help them help us tell a story uh, about the uh, incredible opportunities um, that are out there for patients through these minimally invasive procedures. Yeah, I think one of my favorite one of the, the little short videos is the killing tumors with ice one with uh, the guy who's like playing golf at the beginning or something like that. Oh, Lex was a real character and yeah. uh, and his family was so accommodating, but he really wanted it to be, you know, uh, help us, you know, and I think to use his own words would be to hit it out of the park. And uh, so that was a really enjoyable um, experience. And, you know, I think um, the animation series and certainly our the newest initiative that we're going to talk about today have really... Um, given us the opportunity to continue working to deliver the message uh, to people and expand on that because we were hunkered down looking for opportunities where we, you know, we couldn't go out and burden a hospital. Certainly they would never even have entertained the idea in the last two years of us coming to visit. And we're anxious to get back out there uh, as soon as um, we, you know, things are safe and um, uh, we can uh, start filming again. But being able to continue our mission through these different activities uh, has been really rewarding. I mean, maybe that's a good national or natural transition to the newest initiative. Tell me about the, the patient decision aids. What's, what's that about? Kind of the IR or interventional initiatives, new biggest initiative. There was a big push just a few yeah. days ago for without a scalpel day, obviously near and dear to my heart, but I want to hear from you all. <laughs> so I, I would love to speak at this point. It's Isabel again. Um, so the beginnings of, it, you know, the interventional initiative, what we were trying to do was really, as we mentioned, um, to educate and engage the public about what we call MIPS, Minimally Invasive Image Guided Procedures. And uh, we have a, a writing um, work group. We have different um, subcommittees, but we had um, people working on describing procedures. We had those procedure descriptions in plain language which is at the CDC's um, recommended sixth to eighth grade health literacy level. But it was really a passive kind of, you know, if somebody was interested, they could go check out what these procedures were about. And we hadn't made the conceptual leap yet to how to integrate this into clinical practice. And so um, several years ago, I met you, Eric, and this was at a time when I, you know, had my plate quite full with a bunch of different things. And I definitely was not looking for another mentee. And you were just too extraordinary to pass up. And you um, had this idea to make these patient decision aids, you know, with your background in um, ethics, medical ethics and anthropology, you had a very interesting perspective that I recognized was essential for our field of interventional radiology and many minimally invasive fields um, that are coming to this moment right now, this kind of crossroads where we can either let these sorts of ethical issues sort themselves out or we can consciously direct where they go next. And so I, at that time, Susan was very interested also in um, kind of taking it to the next level where we could um, reach patients more intentionally. Um, Margaret was also very much behind it. And so we kind of came together naturally um, and you had already been working on uh, quite a few of these and maybe I'll let you speak for yourself, but um, as is um, the case with this this team, uh, we were able to kind of take it to the next level thanks to um, a bunch of different factors, which I hope we'll touch on, um, including um, a grant that Susan um, helped us um, achieve, two smaller grants that um, Eric and, and I were able to get, and then just sort of the dream team um, of, you know, everybody's kind of brings a different thing to the table and are able to elevate something that um, sort of starts out uh, rather ordinary to what um, I would describe as an extraordinarily rich tool to use with patients. 
Yeah, that's, well, first of all, very kind words. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you all made this a, a reality for, I mean, I can say for, for my bit that I think that as I just feel like there's always been an inherent gap between clinical practice and the ideal ethics world, and you have to be creative in ways to close that gap because it's not like people are trying to do a bad job. People are doing the best they can, are pretty mentally saturated. So how can you leverage workflows in a way that doesn't add mental exhaustion to people but could do things better? And that was the idea with these decision aids is that, well, if you don't want people to just say, you know, the risk of the procedure is bleeding, bleeding infection, damage to surrounding things every time, you can empower them with statistics and, you know, balance information that's patient friendly. And so we're generally saying at least somewhat the same thing to people and let people make an informed decision for themselves. That was the idea, but I didn't have the resources that you all have. So, I mean, I'd be interested with Susan and Margaret as well about uh, your your inspiration with it. Well, so I have kind of an an interesting, I think, perspective about informed consent. I mean, back in the days when I worked at USCSF, I did spend a lot of time writing information about like little one pagers or front and back sheet explanation of procedures, especially around some of our really high volume, high risk uh, procedures like TIPS. Uh, that was kind of the heyday of TIPS when we were working from seven in the morning to 11 o'clock at night. And, you know, there'd be four or five TIPS on the board in addition to all of our regular workload. And uh, it was really difficult because you know, as as a nurse, basically our responsibilities is to witness a signature on a hospital consent form. So we have no idea what the patient knows, what the family knows, because we're not always there for that conversation. And when you ask a patient, do you have questions? Oftentimes I would just get these like wide-eyed, I don't even know what question to ask. Mm -hmm. And when I moved into the role as a hospital administrator, you know, we have to deal with the Joint Commission and we have to deal with, you know, the state coming in to do inspections. And there was this kind of weird obsession around, you know, coffee cups. And then where is the documentation of informed consent when the um, inspectors would come into the lab? And so, you know, we got really good at making sure that there was a quote unquote informed consent note. And just like you said, Eric, you know, describing risk benefits alternatives uh, were discussed with the patient, but there was really no assessment as to whether the patient understood what was happening. So, you know, I, th there's all these issues um, that I always feel, I always felt like patients didn't really, really know that they were just placing their trust somewhat blindly. And then you add the layer of, you know, they're referred by a physician who knows and trusts what you're doing, but then where are the patients that aren't offered information about what you're doing because there's a kind of an inherent, you know, you're comp competing for um, income and you're competing for patients, right? So the patients that don't get referred, for example, UFI, because the referring physician would come, they're just not in tuned or in partnership with us. So I just saw this as a great opportunity. And certainly, I mean, I, I didn't even in my own imagination think about how effective this this would be and how much I would have loved to have had this when I was actually practicing, you know, to be able to give some easy to comprehend figures and illustrations with very simple language and to also really spell out what the alternatives are, including alternatives that would potentially be from competitors, you know, if we're going to use that type of a, a, of a framework. So I, I think that these are going to be very widely accepted by our, our peers. And I'm, I'm real excited to share them with our nursing partners in Erin and our tech partners in ABIR, because I think there will be great tools for them that will really enhance their uh, communication and their relationship with their patients. Definitely. So my perspective, just to add on to all those great points everyone's made, I initially thought, what a brilliant idea, and it certainly complements our existing initiatives. From our perspective of our of our mission, where we're you know seeking to engage directly with the public, I think the patient decision aids really allow us to reach a broader audience through the patients, their families, referring physicians potentially. It also provides a consistent messaging across the industry. Of course, with the emphasis on the on the ethics approach that Eric mentioned, 
And also it really provides quality graphics that complement the written content, which I think is really important when engaging the public and having them not only understand, comprehend, and, but also retain the information and want to engage with it. Totally. And, and maybe we should be explicit and back up and just say, what, what are these, what is a patient decision aid? And what, what are the interventional initiatives patient decision aids? Perhaps I could answer that. I, I want to just compliment um, all of you for making such great points. And I really love hearing these perspectives. It's funny being in it and knowing and working so close with you, but we rarely have these opportunities just to kind of iterate why and reflect on why we're doing this, which is really um, inspirational. So, so the patient decision aids or decision support aids are written materials that are written, as I mentioned, at the health literacy level that is recommended by the Centers for Disease Control. So it's called plain language and they are in plain language English and in Spanish. Um, there is a description of the procedure. There is a three panel illustration of how the procedure is done. And then there are plainly written risks and benefits. And these are um, based in the literature. So um, the data, it, you know, it's based in data uh, in terms of like what the percentage risks are, but they're depicted in a way that um, people can understand. And so instead of saying there is a 4% chance that you will bleed, there is a four in 100 or four in 100 patients will bleed after this procedure. And it is depicted as a graphic. And so patients who may not be able to, you know, understand statistics in the abstract can see that and see, okay, that's sort of the magnitude of the risk that I'm incurring. And then there is a description of all of the alternatives um, that are commonly used, um, as, as Margaret mentioned. And those um, alternatives are described in enough detail that a patient could ask more about them or see if, you know, it's something that would be um, a viable alternative for them. An important thing to mention, though, is that these patient decision aids are not a substitute for the consent process. They are a tool meant to enrich and augment that process. And our research, um, and we have done clinical trials both at UCSD and at, at Stanford, our research is showing that it does just that. It enriches that, that conversation. It makes patients um, feel like they understand what they're going through better. It makes them feel more satisfied. And curiously, it makes them feel like they've spent more time with the clinician having this very important conversation, even though the amount of time does not change. So we feel that it is an incredibly powerful tool that, as uh, Susan mentioned, is augmented through these gorgeous illustrations. You know, each one has uh, what we call our hero shot, or I think Susan has an even better term for it. Um, what was this, the term you were using, Susan? storyboard that's the storyboard there they it's just like you can look at these pictures and they are illustrated by this beautiful artist who works um uh he's out of london and it, they're just absolutely gorgeous um that kind of give you this sense of the gestalt for procedure you know what happens and what the value is to the patient but then you have the nuts and bolts illustrations um which give charles burke has actually contributed to uh, with his artwork and also Susan Jackson with her artwork um, to make these, you know, very clear as to what a patient would expect. You know, what do I come in? What happens while I'm there? What will it look like when I leave? Um, and that gives people a much clearer view of what they are signing on for. So they don't feel like things are happening to them. We really want to um, enhance patient autonomy and patient agency because research shows that patients who choose what's best for them do better. And so that's why we have dedicated ourselves to this initiative. I think that's beautifully put. And I mean, you basically just answered this question, but I think that it's worth worth saying is that what, what would you say to people saying, well, you know, I do, I do consent great. Like our practice is, is doing great. We have informational tools. Most practices have informational stuff that they give to patients. Why? Why is this a need? Because I definitely get that critique for things that I write when I talk to people about this all the time. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, our materials are singular. Um, they they are you go through rigorous standards, even by our very high standards. So what happens is 
They are written, the, the patient de decision aids are written by, um, by Eric to begin um, using all the data that he mines from, you know, different sources to get statistics that are, that are evidence-based. Um, they go through initial um, editing um, by B that incorporates all of the writings that have already be been done by our um, written content committee. So that incorporates plain language. They are edited for plain language. Um, Margaret has um, a keen eye to the editing process. And then they go to a vetting group that is led um, by Denise Tu who um, she has uh, amassed a group of diverse English speaking um, people who represent the public, who um, read these materials and offer input. That input is then integrated um, and we have a new version that's then translated into Spanish. The Spanish versions are then, um, and th that translation process um, happens with the help of Consuelo Salceda, uh, her late mother, who helped us quite a bit on this project as well. And now our newest member um, is uh, Luis Monterroso, who helps us um, with the Spanish as well. And then they go through a vetting process. And then what comes out on the other side is further edited, um, both in English and Spanish at a high level to make sure that um, everything is consistent. Then it goes to our, um, our process where we add um, the graphics and we have a, a graphic designer, and this is where Susan um, works her magic, making I'm sure that everything looks uh, beautiful and engaging. And from a um, a user um, level, is uh, something that people want to um, to look at and is easy to understand. So I'm going through this process just to let you know, and there are various other steps that this is not something where you know someone in a in a dark room is writing what they think patients should know. It's an iterative process that also includes, as I mentioned, the um, the clinical trials to ensure that these materials achieve the goal that we have set out to achieve. So, you know, I would say that many of the things that are out there are well intentioned, um, and but most of them are written above the um, plain language um, level, most most above the health literacy level, most at at about like an eleventh grade or higher. Um, even ones by reputable sources and our own um, societies. And it's because we've lost the ability to really know how to speak in a way that, that patients can understand. So I would, um, just to summarize, say that, you know, our materials um, have been carefully crafted, carefully vetted and tested, um, both in a real world setting. And I think we can talk about our beta testing maybe, and then also um, our clinical trial setting. And so they, they, they achieve sort of all those levels. Yeah, I think it's really that extensive vetting process with incorporation of the end user because, I mean, like you said, there's actually quite a bit of data showing that most clinicians feel they do a great job at consent. But then when you talk to patients, a large portion of them don't understand and don't feel like they're making an informed concision or don't feel like they got the information that they needed. Whereas these type of aids pretty consistently help. But then if you there's other data reviewing what's already out there in terms of from societies and practices in radiology and IR, and they're pretty much almost unanimously above the average reading level and with difficult readability scores. So it seems like that really sets these interventional initiative patient decision aids apart. That's right. There's an intentional inclusion of the stakeholders at every level, which I think makes any product for anything um, better. But Susan's a perfect person to comment now. My point was just simply, if, if someone were to raise that objection to me, I would simply say, take a look at them and, and see. Uh, we recently had the opportunity to have uh, some early versions reviewed at a thought leader session at the most recent Western Angio Conference, and uh, the response was, was overwhelmingly positive. And so, um, and these are, are people who I would think have already a, a pretty good consent process in place in their institutions or they're, they're really respected physicians. And so I would just say, take a look at them if, if you, um, and, and then make a decision if you see them. I'd also add that oftentimes we just kind of take the path of least resistance and we look to vendors who create their beautiful, you know, trifold patient education forms. They're really just promoting a product. And what we be, what we've done consciously has been very kind of product or device uh, neutral in this. So it kind of removes that layer of kind of ickiness, if you will. I also think that 
the ability for this to be printed and kept in the doctor's office or in a clinic or in the IR lab or the fact that it's available to be viewed on a, you know, on a tablet or on a computer. Wherever you're seeing the patient, you have access to this information. And so a patient comes to clinic and they go through the consent process. They can bring this home. It's really easy to read. They can share it with their family. They can share it with their children uh, and, and have that conversation and perhaps kind of think about more questions to ask when they come for the day of procedure. Mm. So it's, a, it's kind of a unique thing. And I think I'm sure there's some great practices out there that have invested the time in this. But by far, uh, in the surveys that I've done with uh, nurses, very few have, if any, have uh, practice-specific or hospital-specific instructions available to them. Hmm. I think you brought up a good point, too, about, because I'm sure people would ask why why handouts? You know, why why go analog rather than, like, videos or virtu- vir- virtual reality or, or something like that? Um, why Why start with handouts? Well, I think it's just the simplicity of it, number one. And, you know, uh, m- many of our patients are older and not all tech savvy. My mom thinks Facebook is the internet. Uh, So, you know, with great respect, uh, I know there are a lot of uh, older patients that are very savvy with tech, but I just think it's a comfort thing. So you're giving them options. And if they're comfortable with their computers, then as I said before, you have the option to view it through our beautiful portal, public facing portal, and, uh, you know, see this information in real time on their computer or on their tablet. That's good you know, point. I think we're just all about access and um, analog is accessible to everybody. Um, and, you know, not only barriers due to technological experience, but also socioeconomic um, factors. You know, not everybody has access to computers. Um, reading things on a, on a phone, if that's all you have, can be very difficult. So having something that is um, that can be printed out and handed to a patient can be very valuable. You know, m- most of my patients are at the VA um, and the veterans, um, with very few exceptions, are, are really not too interested in checking the Internet for this type of thing. Sometimes they can or sometimes they're willing, but they'd much rather leave the visit with something tangible, especially if it's something that I have been able to mark up. And we actually have an exciting kind of innovative um, solution to that interactive uh, experience of when a physician is explaining or a clinician is explaining um, a procedure and you can personalize it for the patient by marking up um, a picture or drawing a picture. I don't know if anybody wants to um, to introduce our, our scratch pad concept. Well, I could say maybe just reflecting back as far as like what this would look like in real time in a clinical workflow. You know, it sounds like I'm the patient, I get scheduled for to talk about liver directed therapy in clinic. Maybe it sounds like I can have this handout like sent to me ahead of time, or maybe we also have handouts in clinic. And then the the scratch pad idea is, you know, this idea that we, a lot of people, not just interventional radiologists, like drawing pictures and the patients really like it too. So the idea is to try and provide some like anatomy specific pads where you can supplement these handouts and draw, okay, here is, here is your tumor in the liver and here's the game plan of what we're going to be, be doing. And then again, empower people with that information to make an informed decision. Yeah. I love the idea of the scratch pad and I, I don't know if we st- stole it from the cardiologist, uh, <laughs> which is kind of ironic, right? But the cardiologists um, use it very effectively to identify where, you know, using the the coronary anatomy. And I think the patients love it. I remember my father-in-law had his on the kitchen table so that he could show everybody uh, where his stent was and where his bypass was and and whatnot. So I think um, these could be great little add-on tools. Are there other ways that that you all see this integrating into the the IR workflow? Like what about for for inpatients or, or things like that? Like maybe someone's not coming to clinic. That's what we're hoping is um, by having the flexibility of different platforms to share this material, we could use it um, to have those difficult conversations with inpatients or even in emergency settings, you know, where you're mm. meeting a family under duress for the first time and you're saying, look, I'm this c- kind of doctor that you've never even heard of. And I'm going to do this thing that you've never heard of, and we're going to try to save your family member. 
um, giving, um, you know, having that conversation, but giving them something tangible to hold on to and to review after you're having that dizzying conversation can be um, can be very helpful. Um, but one thing that was recommended to us in our thought leader sessions um, at Western Indian, I was really glad that Susan brought that up, is that these could be tools for educating a referring physicians. And so one of the um, the IRs mentioned, you know, if I'm receiving a um, a patient from a referring physician, I would probably send them a link to the materials that I am going to be sharing with the patient that we have in common so that they can see what I'm, I'm doing to educate our mutual patient. And then through that process, also raise their awareness about what we um, offer and kind of the risks and benefits because we assume, or maybe we we don't, that this information is is known by all of our referring physicians. But you know, in reality, medicine is becoming so specialized and our field is moving so quickly that it's not possible for our referring physicians to be responsible for the information at this level. And so we really need to help them. And um, that idea of sending it to the referring physicians as um, not only a, hey, heads up, this is what we're saying, but as a tool to spread this information more widely was a really great one. I'm kind of hoping that they might... Um take it to another level within their uh, electronic medical records and look to see if they can't integrate it. So it's very accessible to the nursing staff in the hospitals and to the hospitalists that they can just go right into Epic or go into Cerner or whatever their primary medical record is and be able to download that and share it with the patient as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's really multidimensional, I think, you know, patient facing and clinician facing in terms of our referring partners. What, what about uh, next steps in terms of, I know that we've mentioned there's the beta testing, the clinical trials, different use cases now. What does that look like? This is a in and of itself an, an initiative that's quite weighty. Um, obviously, there are a lot of procedures that, um, that we are creating patient decision aids for. And in tandem, as everyone's mentioned, we are developing a, a digital twin, uh, so uh, the same page on our on our website. We are looking at also developing them in an app that's that's in in the works right now. So there's different ways of accessing it, but uh, all of that is is still in the works and uh, making a lot of progress thanks to uh, Isabel mentioned before, we have grant funding that has allowed us to extend our team to consultants that can help us with some of the components of the development. And so I think that's really where our, we're focused right now. But uh, we have, I think this team has so much vision and ideas about where where we can take it. And we're also looking for feedback from anyone who's beta testing and anyone who might be listening to this podcast. Yeah, exactly. No, I think that it's exactly well put. I also think uh, you know, we hope to engage more people too in this this initiative, reach out to different societies and, and things like that. Think about different multimedia that we could put these on is something that we have discussed as well. I mean, we mentioned why we wanted to start with handouts as a thing, but maybe having short video supplements or things like that. Yeah, we um, we definitely want short videos um, to supplement some ideas or some difficult concepts. Um, you know, we have a lot of experience in videos of various lengths, but what we're talking about is micro videos to illustrate things um, that might be hard to grasp, even with a static um, image. And so those that would be like um, part of our next wave of things that we're doing and certainly would be based in um, all the materials that we have already created. But rather than just sort of fire those off, we um, really want to see what engagement comes out of um, the beta testing and, you know, some of our initial ex experiences to say this would be the best area to concentrate on for, um, you know, additional resources like like videos. And so that's why I think it's just so important to uh, make sure that stakeholders and end users are involved in this process. And it's not a static process. It's an iterative one. Um, and we're grateful to, to those who are beta testing because, you know, we have had um, a lot of interest across many different practice types. Um, you know, I work at the VA and my colleagues cannot wait to get this. I, you know, I have a lot of input from my MSK colleagues on some of the MSK procedures and they're just chomping at the bit. You know, uh, 
Brad Wood at the NIH has been extremely supportive and interested in, in this initiative. Uh, we have, um, you know, maybe I'll let uh, one of my colleagues talk about who is involved in beta testing, but there are a wide variety of practice types. So this isn't, you know, something that is only for, you know, an academic type practice or only for, um, you know, one type of, you know, high volume IO or something. This is meant to be uh, very, very uh, widely adopted and used um, and available to uh, to anybody who wants it. Yeah, exactly. You know, I think maybe one thing that we should talk about in closing or that I, I asked you about is that, you know, there's a wide array of listeners to, to Backtable, uh, all different stages of their career. A lot of trainees listen to it, different specialties. So how would you all answer as far as people getting, getting involved with it? I think that if, you know, if people listen to this and say, Hey, how could I get involved with that initiative? How could I help the interventional initiative, get the word out there with these patient decision aids? What would you tell them? I would say for the physicians who are in practice, regardless of, of their practice type or their clinical setting, use the patient decision aids would be one way to um, get involved and, and help us give us feedback on those. I would also say to industry, all of this is made possible by grants. We're a nonprofit. Any sort of um, donations or grants that, that can come our way all goes right back into these initiatives and in the development of those. So those would be the two call outs I would make. Isabel and Margaret, what about you? I would just add really quickly that in addition to industry, we have a um, great deal of support by individuals who make donations. And um, these are individuals that, that um, we respect deeply and who, you know, give us a vote of confidence by um, giving sizable donations. And for a long time, um, that constituted um, about half of what we were able to fundraise, you know, th thanks to um, the larger grant that Susan was um, able to, you know, facilitate our getting. Um, we've been able to accelerate our efforts, but, you know, personal donations have been extremely helpful for us. Um, not only do they fund these, these important um, projects, but they also um, represent a vote of confidence and a sense of belonging. And we consider anybody who supports us, you know, by wearing their scrub hats, by donating, by spreading the word to be um, a part of, of what we consider, you know, a transformative initiative for our field and for patients. I'd also add that if anybody would like to um, join our group of uh, hospitals in clinics that are beta testing, in the short term as we're producing more of these. It'd be wonderful to have them as partners with that. Yeah, I think that people could reach out to, to any of us to, to start facilitating that connection. I know Susan's really been the one spearheading our connections with our, our beta testing sites, but I'm sure we could all connect people. Susan, would you like to give a shout out to our beta sites? Thank you, Margaret, I would. We are very appreciative for a number of physicians who are working on beta testing some of these PDAs. So those individuals or those groups, those practice groups are Luke Sewell in VIR Chicago. They're testing a number of different PDAs. In Denver, we have Peter Horner, who is also testing a variety of PDAs. Charlie Nutting is testing some of our interventional oncology PDAs. Mary Cosentino in Portland, Oregon is testing the UFI PDAs. And we have Sean Tower in Central California, Fresno, California specifically, who is uh, testing a variety as well. So thanks to those individuals and their practice groups for your feedback. Yeah, Good so job. kind of a, a whole variety, both geographically and in terms of, of practice type. Right. So I think if, if somebody has a high volume of a specific procedure that they would like to see these in English and Spanish, those would be great people to kind of reach out. Exactly. Well, I think that I mean, we got the opportunity to talk a bit about the, the history of the interventional initiative, all the important work around advocacy around minimally invasive procedures, the new patient decision aids, and how that is hopefully working to make informed consent and informed choice in interventional radiology. I wonder, kind of in closing now, are there other things that we should talk about or other things that are on your all's minds It's important to get out there about what the interventional initiative's doing? Do you want to um, just make a statement about shared decision making, just to kind of reiterate th that point and how this supports that? Sure. So it's actually 
one of the many common misconceptions about, I think, the ideal of informed consent is that s some people seem to s think that, well, the idea is just patient autonomy in the sense that, well, it's whatever the patient wants, that's informed consent. But it, it's not actually, actually what informed consent was coming about in the 20th century, the idea is that, well, most people aren't going to be informed consumers. And so you actually have a, a duty as their clinician to empower them and even offer a recommendation. And so that's the idea of shared decision-making, which is actually the more common ideal of informed consent is that you are respecting their autonomy or empowering them with information. You want to help them choose something that is aligned with their, their values and preferences. But at the same time, you as the content expert are, are helping them as a guide on that journey. That's, that's kind of the ideal of shared decision-making. The way that this supports that is that a lot of times, as I was mentioning before, there, there's, a, there's a gap in terms of actually having an informed choice. And often what fills that gap is trust. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. There, there's going to be an inherent trust, hopefully, between the clinician and, and patient. But assuming that trust is paternalistic. And so what these do is it helps empower people with saying, how big do they want that gap to be? It's okay if you, you say, I don't really want to know that much about it. But a lot of times patients that say that and say, you know, whatever you think, doc, when they've talked to those patients afterwards in studies, it ends up that people that say that tend to be people that feel like that they don't have a chance of understanding the information. And so what these help do is kind of level the playing field in the sense of a lot of our patients have a lot of diversity in their preferences and needs, health literacy, health numeracy. This helps kind of get people to a basic understanding to then have a more fruitful, informed consent, shared decision-making conversation. Excellently put. Bravo. Yeah, very well said. Well, I think that that basically concludes, unless there's something else, I really appreciate you three taking the time to share this, this important thing. I, I'd encourage people, like we said, to reach out, get involved with this. If, if it resonates with them, they could go to the Interventional Initiatives website, which is theii.org and find out more because we're also revamping that interface as well. Thank you so much, Eric. And thanks to Backtable for um, this opportunity and for also just being a, a great supporter and um, partner with us. Um, we really appreciate you guys. Well, okay, that concludes our episode. Again, everyone, thank you for listening to Backtable, your source for everything endovascular and interventional. We've had the awesome privilege today to learn more about the interventional initiative and their newest initiative, patient decision aids to make informed consent and informed choice in interventional radiology. Thank you and keep listening. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, Brian Hartley. Our audio team lead is Karen Gannon with support from Caleb Hodson and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Zubi Syed. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Anne Dang. And newsletter by Lauren Fang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.